I know you've got an ear out for the start of the podcast, but before we jump into today's episode, I wanted to remind you to keep an eye out for Daryl Lee's limited edition Christmas treats, because they're in stores now. Like the iconic Christmas nougat pudding, so yummy and a, and a gorgeous little gift. And some delicious Chrissy-themed twists on your favourite treats, like the Daryl Lee Rockley Road with chewy red and green jelly pieces, green and red crunchy milk chocolate balls, my favourites, and green apple and strawberry flavoured licorice. Watch them disappear. Your Christmas treats table will pop with colour and scrumptiousness. Spread some joy, bring the fun, and enjoy the Christmas tradition that is Daryl Lee. Hurry before they sell out. Daryl Lee makes Christmas better. This is The Five of My Life with me, Nigel Marsh. The series where I talk to notable people about five of their defining things. The way it works is my guests always choose a favourite film, book, song, place and possession. They tell me their choices in advance so I can research them, but they don't tell me why they've chosen them. That's the subject of our conversation. The reason I devised this series is I wanted to create a slightly different way to gain an insight into the real lives and thoughts of prominent people. Julia Eileen Gillard is the former Prime Minister of Australia, the 27th person and first woman to serve in that role. She occupied the top office in the land from 2010 to 2013. Widely acclaimed for her dignified conduct since leaving politics, she continues to make a valuable contribution to the nation through numerous roles, notably including chairing the mental health organisation Beyond Blue and her seminal book, Women and Leadership, which presents the lessons that can be learned from women leaders around the world. So welcome, Julia Gillard, to Five of My Life. Very pleased to be here. Thank you for having me. Can I start by saying congratulations on your book, Women and Leadership? I finished it last night and wow, fantastic. Oh, thank you very much. It's always great to get the feedback from people who are reading it. You know, you spend so many hours locked away writing that for it to be loose in the real world is just a joy. What you did in preparation for that book is you asked uh, eight remarkable female leaders a, a, a set of standard questions which is the device that we have here on Five of My Life. I ask a whole host of different people the same uh, question, the the, the film, the book, the song, the place, uh, the possession. Um, But one of the questions I ask everybody at the end, it's a secret question that's become not so secret, uh, the sixth question is, who would you like to hear on Five of My Life next? And when I asked Richard Glover, the the radio chap, uh, um, who he wanted to hear next, he said, your dear self. And then when I asked Tanya Plebisek, who she wanted to hear next, she said you. So before uh, we get into your five choices, I'd just like you to chat to your relationship with, with Tanya. Is that a friendship that goes beyond politics? I, I don't know anything about it. I just thought I should ask. We started in politics at the same time. We were both elected in 1998. That was a fairly big changeover election. So as you might remember, uh, Labor had lost in 1996. Paul Keating was then Prime Minister and John Howard became Prime Minister. And in 1998, a lot of the long-serving Labor MPs who had been part of the Hawke and Keating era decided it was time to go. And so I got a seat in Victoria and Tanya won in New South Wales and we've known each other since then. So we served all of those years in Parliament together and we still stay in good contact now. Oh, that's fantastic. So so it it goes beyond the political career. You're mates just as mates as opposed to colleagues. That's right. We've... uh, One of the things that happens when you leave is you've got to reinvent the friendships because you were there all day, every day with each other, sharing this incredibly intense experience. But when one of you leaves, as I have, then you've got to find a new wavelength for the friendship and we've done that. Oh, that's, that's wonderful. To, I, I've really enjoyed um, chatting to her and I'm delighted that she suggested yourself and I'm, I'm glad that you are here. So let's get into your, into your five. Now, I was really looking forward to uh, learning of your film choice because I read somewhere, and, and this might be, I mean, you can tell me whether this is rubbish or not, that you and your sister obsess on movies. Is that correct? or is? is... Oh, it's um, more true of my sister than me. Uh, my sister could absolutely go on one of those, you know, quiz shows with a special area of expertise being, <laughs> actors and directors and she'd blitz it. Uh, So that means that I don't have to bear any of the burden of remembering any of the details. I just get to watch. 
Uh, the Gillard family does tend to gravitate towards horror movies, zombies, vampires, <laughs> schlock horror. We do a fair line in that together. <laughs> well, you have chosen the film adaptation of Solomon Northup's 1853 slave memoir, 12 Years a Slave. Uh, it came out in 2013. Would you mind telling me why you've chosen that? I watched it on a plane. I didn't watch it when it first came out. I often miss the movie cycle by a long, long shot. So then I'm wandering around talking to people about a movie and they're like, oh, I saw that three years ago. So I do that a bit. Uh, but I watched it on a plane and I find that there's something especially intense about watching movies on planes, you know, darkened cabin, mm. um, people kind of slumbering around you. It just feels like it's you and the movie. And I often found, find that I'm more uh, emotional, more reactive towards movies in that environment. And I found it such a powerful film, so explicit on the uh, rhythms and strictures of slavery. And, of course, you've seen that brought to the screen many times before, but there was a special intensity to this. I mean, I, mean, I watched it again in your honour, but I, I found it really upsetting. I, I, mean, I mean, obviously upsetting, but as in just it sort of sits with you and I but just, oh, gosh. But it, it made me want to ask you actually bizarrely about your book, because in your book, you, you talk to, as I've said, eight remarkable uh, female leaders, but one of them is the former president of Liberia, a country beset by ongoing problems caused by American uh, slavery. And, and I, I just wanted to ask if you wouldn't mind talking about Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, because to my shame... I had never heard of her and I stayed up all night Googling her and reading about her because what an amazing woman. So if you wouldn't mind just telling us a little bit about her and, and some of the lessons you've gleaned from her. Sure, absolutely. And I hope one of the delights of this book for people is that it brings to them the story of women leaders they wouldn't necessarily know about. You know, we obviously interview people who would be very familiar names to Australians, Jacinda Ardern, Hillary Clinton, Theresa May from the UK. But I'm hoping people discover some new stories. And Ellen's story is she is the first woman to have led a nation in Africa. Liberia was formed as a country when Americans in the abolitionist movement concluded that what ought to happen once slavery was gone was that the former slaves, the freed slaves, should be returned to Africa. And so there was a movement to um, ship people to Africa, to Liberia, and it's one of those things that with the remove of history, you look at and just say to yourself, what on earth could people have been thinking? Um, <laughs> because, of course, they were uh, returning to Africa, people who had no contemporary experience of living there. Uh, they were returning them to a different part of Africa, not their homeland. Uh, there were local Indigenous people who obviously resented uh, having people transported into their country. Uh, there was uh, therefore warfare, violence, disease, famine, you name it. And the uh, fissures that that created between Indigenous people and the uh, those who came from America still show in Liberian politics, or at least did until relatively recently. And it's been a nation that's uh, had to face many bouts of civil war. And Ellen Johnson Sirleaf was, in the course of those troubles, imprisoned, exiled, um, a truly dramatic life story, imprisoned at one point for a length of sentence in such a hellhole of a prison that she thought she was unlikely to survive it. Uh, but at the end of all of that, when peace came, and that was achieved largely through the activism of women who said enough, no more, she was elected as the first president after all of that and had on her shoulders the huge responsibility of trying to rebuild this nation. I, I just found it so inspirational. There's, there's a little bit of, I suppose, dark humour in the story. The role of women in actually getting them to sign the peace accord and stop massacring each other was they threatened public nudity. That story, they, they were demonstrating that the Muslim women and the Christian women got together and said, enough is enough. The men are ruining this place. You know, we're not going to go until you, you know, bang your heads together and sort it out. And they still wouldn't say, we're going to strip off. 
if you don't. Yes, which to which to our ears sounds, yeah, yeah, I mean, almost comedic, doesn't it? And if a group of women protesting a particular cause uh, went to a centre of an Australian city and said, we're going to strip off, I suspect, uh, watching crowds would say, whatever, you know. <laughs> uh, this is going to be a little bit interesting. We'll get the phone up to take some footage and uh, be circulating it around on social media. Uh, but in their culture, it was an unthinkable act, um, an act that could only be born of the greatest desperation and something that was just truly, uh, you know, people couldn't comprehend that women would protest that way. And so it garnered attention and in doing so created another piece of pressure to get you know, tribal leaders, warlords to enter into the Accra Peace Accords. There's so much to learn from the book. I absolutely loved it. Another thing that struck me, and I love the the breadth of the people that you spoke to, whether it's UK or America or Africa or New Zealand, it is despite the differences, obviously, I mean, you're the first woman to, to run Australia and she was the first woman to run an African nation, but there are other people who are the, you know, the third or the second or the third in a, in a country to do it. So, you know, and, and different hemispheres. So completely different situations. Yet there was the three commonalities that women leaders have to face. Yeah, I mean, each of the women leaders, irrespective of these incredible differences in culture and context, um, ended up saying that what they wore drew disproportionate attention and they had to work their way through that. Uh, that there was a great deal of interest in their family structures and judgments made about them in relation to their family. And each of them felt that they had to navigate uh, this narrow path between being seen as strong enough to lead, but also not just coming on strong, because if you didn't show any characteristics people associate with women, then there would be an adverse reaction to that. So they needed to meld together strength and empathy to be viewed as acceptable leaders. And there's some wonderful little moments where even when they're at the highest levels of politics, uh, they talk about going to meetings and putting an idea on the table and um, no one reacting. And then a man putting the same idea on the table later in the discussion and everybody going, oh my God, that's genius. Yes. Uh, so I think almost every woman could say, well, yep, I've been there, done that. I know what that feels like. Welcome to the Can't Win Club. Oh, gosh. Well, we're going to move from an Oscar winner to a Pulitzer Prize winner. Your book, you've chosen John Steinbeck's 1939 harrowing classic, The Grapes of Wrath. Would you mind telling me why you've chosen that, Julia? I'm at this point moderately concerned that you think that I watch very uh, deep, dark (laughs) movies and I read harrowing novels. Uh, Maybe all of that's true, but I chose The Grapes of Wrath. Uh, I studied it here. I'm in Adelaide now. It's where I grew up. And I studied it when I was at Unley High School quite a few years ago. And it, you know, it was a very adult book in in every sense, um, you know. So, in some ways, I remember it as one of the first truly deep adult books that I would have read, or at least stays with me still. I'd read a lot of you know Austen and things like that, but this is of a different genre, and the message in it of the essential dignity of working people in the face of unimaginably bad odds and hardship uh, really resonated with me and resonated with what was my emerging value system. And so it's stayed with me ever since. There's a quote from Steinbeck when he was writing it. He said to a friend, you know, what are you trying to do, John? Uh, and it's, I, I, I love this quote. He said, I want to put a tag of shame on the greedy bastards who are responsible for the Great Depression and its effects. And, and I just think, you know, because you can't read that book without being, you know, intensely moved and, and, and just the, the, the gross unfairness of how we organise society. And, and I, this is just a personal view, is when things go belly up, like in the GFC or whatever else, it always seems that the top end of town gets away with it and the people who suffer disproportionately are the people at the bottom ends of the bloody ladder um i, I just be interested in you talking to that and and a if i'm if i'm wrong but b, b what we can do to make that not be the case 
I think that's right. And I think in the age in which we live, whilst um, in a country like Australia, absolute living standards have continued to rise. So um, even, uh, you know, Australians who are in the poorest uh, income strata, you know, live with things that uh, 20, 30, 40 years ago, could people couldn't even imagine of having. So I don't think we should uh, underestimate the kind of societal progress we are capable of. But with all of that, here in Australia and around the world, there is rising inequality, not at the dimensions of other countries, but still troubling as it rises, and a sense that you know, life for the next generation is not necessarily going to be an easier one. And I think the most profound thing that societies have to believe about themselves is that the sons and daughters of the present generation are going to get a life that's more full of opportunity. And when people no longer believe that, and often for good reason, I think that's when you truly get fracturing and discontent. And so out of big economic shocks like the global financial crisis, obviously, like the one that we're living through now, uh, making sure that we can keep open the pathways of opportunity, I think, is just pivotal to, um, you know, everything that we want to achieve as human beings, but it's also pivotal to the Australian ethos of a fair go. Yeah, absolutely. Would you describe yourself as a, as a long range optimist? Oh, I'm a long range optimist, absolutely. And, um, you know, anything um, that I've lived through in my life tells me that if you can maintain your sight line into the longer term, then you will see improvement. But um, it doesn't it doesn't come in a linear fashion. And one of the things I talk about when I speak to people about feminism and women and leadership and gender equality is they're called waves of feminism for a reason. You know, waves come with backwash. It's not just forward, forward, forward. Uh, And so you've got to settle in for the recognition that there will be some very big jumps forward, but then some pushback too. I love that way of expressing it. There's another way, which is that the arc of justice is long, but it bends towards the light. That's right. The the arc of the moral universe, yes. the great Martin Luther King yeah. quote. So we're going to move from the 30s to the 80s for your song that we're going to add to the Five My Life Spotify playlist. You have chosen, I love this. It brings a, a lump to my throat whenever I hear this. Bruce Woodley and Dobe Newton's 1987, We Are Australian. One of the things you do in politics is you go to a lot of functions, a lot of events. I was uh, education minister, even as prime minister, I visited a lot of schools. I've still, whenever I move around the country now, I end up, people run up to me and say, oh, you visited my school when I was in grade four or grade seven (laughs) or grade nine, all of which just makes me feel hugely old, but it's nice that people do it. And almost always there would be two songs. There would be the national anthem and then there would be uh, We Are Australians. And, you know, everybody would get into the national anthem. I think we sing that with more confidence than we used to. You know, I'm of the generation that we picked the national anthem and forever uh, no one knew the words. But I think that there's confidence around singing the national anthem now. But there's true emotion around singing those words about uh, being Australians together. You know, I am, you are, we are Australian. I think people really respond to that. Well, I mean, a, a, a sort of a confession it, it, as a migrant, I mean, it speaks to me. It's a view of a nation that I want to be a part of. And, and, and thinking of the type of nation that we are and nation building, I, I wanted to ask you about a hero that we share, um, a Niren Bevan. Uh, would you would you mind just telling us a little bit about Aniron and why you admire him? I grew up on stories of Nye Bevan, and that's because uh, I was born in Wales, uh, as was my sister Alison. Uh, my mother and father are Welsh, and we migrated here in 1966. My sister was seven and I was four. So I didn't have any original memories of Wales. She's got some, you know, vague, kitty kind of memories, but I didn't have any original ones. And mum and dad, you know, deliberately came to Australia because they rightly identified it as a nation in which 
they would have better opportunities and particularly the ability to build a better life for my sister and I and all that came happily true. Uh, but they wanted us to have a connection with being Welsh, to understand what it was to be Welsh. They both spoke with Welsh accents. We had family back in Wales. And so you would hear the stories. And my father uh, always was someone with a keen interest in politics. He'd listen to Question Time on the radio. He'd read the newspapers. He'd always have a view about contemporary affairs. And he wanted us to know about the Welsh political heroes. And of course, Nye Bevan um, is one of those who strode the political stage and is remembered as the father of the National Health Service. So brought an incredibly profound equity reform uh, to the people of the United Kingdom. Uh, so in the same way that we would remember uh, Whitlam and Medibank and ultimately it becoming Medicare, uh, that's the kind of reputation that Nye Bevan had. And for me, uh, he, he, uh, he sort of speaks to me of the old political divide you know, growing up for me where the, the left, for want of a better phrase, but the left you know, cares deeply for the working family. He sort of sums it up like a simple, I know the left hasn't got a monopoly on compassion, but you look at a man and you read, you know, Nye Bevan's writings and you go, my goodness, he wanted a better life for all. Oh, what, a, what, a, what, a, what a chap. <laughs> what a chap. I, I agree with all of that. And, you know, having universal quality health care, um, you know, the way we have here, uh, Medicare, free public hospitals, the development of the National Health Service in the UK, um, sometimes we just take these things for granted because they've always been there. But it does pay to remember here in Australia, before Whitlam uh, created uh, free public hospitals, yes. uh, one of the single biggest reason people would end up going to jail was because of unpaid debts. And one of the big drivers of unpaid debts were families who could not pay doctor's yeah. bills. And, you know, you just hear that now and it just, it's unimaginable uh, that a family would end up in that circumstance. But that's how it used to be. And it took activism and thought to change it. And here we are in the middle of a global pandemic. And what shows is as the pandemic hits countries, the fault lines, the fractures, the inequalities underneath, and the countries that have lacked quality universal health care are the countries that have done the worst. So you think of a nation like the United States, where if you've got uh, money and resources, you can get the best health care on the planet. Um, but so many people just can't get the health care they need. Yeah, it needs visionaries who are prepared to yeah, make a change. Uh, moving on to your fourth choice. Now, I have to tell you, Miss Gillard, that all your choices have been unique because you are a unique individual. <laughs> but your fourth choice has uh, had one other of my guests that's been similar. So Lane Beachley chose the ocean and Julia Gillard has chosen the seaside. Uh, define the seaside for me and tell me why you've chosen it. Well, Lane Beachley engages in the ocean in a different way to me. <laughs> you look at it. <laughs> so I think she would say ocean because she's far offshore uh, hunting the perfect wave so that she can ride it with consummate skill and athleticism. Um, that's not me. Um, <laughs> Uh, and so I've used the more humble expression seaside <laughs> uh, because really I'm on the sand uh, looking out. Um, I do I do like to swim in the ocean, but um, more routinely what I do is I like to walk uh, alongside the water and just feel the air. I'm a big believer that there is something restorative for uh, your soul, for your body, for everything, if you can get some ocean air. That's the perfect link, Julia, for me to ask you to talk about your Beyond Blue role. Uh, um, you're talking about the restorative effects of a, a walk by the seaside. It is, uh, you do wonderful work for Beyond Blue. Would you mind just talking a little bit about that? Yes, I'm the current chair of Beyond Blue. I took that over a few years ago from Jeff Kennett, who, of course, uh, everybody would remember as a Conservative politician, Premier of Victoria. But after his time in politics, he 
took very seriously mental health. He wanted to make a big difference. Jeff's a very can-do kind of person. And he created uh, Beyond Blue and built it into the organisation it is today. And it's about awareness raising, but also behaviour changing. Um, it's about innovation in services, trying to uh, think up new ways of meeting needs, experimenting with them, then showing what works, and then trying to persuade government to bring it to scale. But most people would know Beyond Blue because they or a family member have reached out and used our services as a mental health support. So they might have rung the telephone line and certainly in their hundreds of thousands, Australians are now contacting the coronavirus wellbeing support line or they may have engaged online through the website, been in a chat room, got some resources that they needed. Uh, and so it's all a way of saying we can never address mental health needs unless we're prepared to talk about them and encourage people to reach out for help when they need it. And in this pressurised time, you know, we would all expect, and it's completely understandable, that more people need support than in a more usual cycle in Australia. Yeah, wonderful organisation. Um, we're moving on to the, the, the fifth and last choice, which is uh, typically my favourite one, because it's where people get more personal. I think you have as well. Uh, you have chosen a photograph of your father. Uh, would you mind describing it for us and then telling us why you've chosen it? Sure. The uh, I've got many photos, of course, of my father and mother, but this photo is one of Dad kind of caught... Um, not unawares, he has obviously had someone call out to him and the photograph's been snapped, but he is at the kitchen sink, he's washing dishes, he's got a tea towel just draped over his shoulder and it says a lot to me about him as a man because that's who he was. Uh, it says a lot to me about... Uh, you know, now I do so much work on gender stereotypes. It says a lot to me about men who don't live confined by those stereotypes. And it says a lot to me about life being about the small moments, not necessarily the grand occasions. I think that's a wonderful, uh, a wonderful possession to have chosen. There's a phrase, if you're going to be it, you need to see it. And the story, actually, Richard Glover was telling me about the... Uh, about the Indian girls and the outcomes are different when they see other female leaders. So like you seeing your dad actually doing washing up that might be in a different environment considered as a gender non-appropriate, whatever else. Well, it's not gender inappropriate if you see your dad doing it. So it's just modelling the right behaviour. And on the, the small things, for me, I, I worry that our media doesn't have the capacity to have balance and perspective and celebrate the victories. And I love the way earlier when you were talking about how far we've come, it is possible to acknowledge two things at the same time. There is lots to do. There will always be lots to do. But let's look back at the life of people in the 1300s, the 1600s, the 1800s. You know, we've come a long way. So I, I think it's a really lovely message about the small things because in reality, not, not many of us can be, you know, JFK or Winston Churchill or Ellen... Johnson Salif or, or Julia Gillard. We're, we're just sort of doing the best we can, putting one foot in front of the other. And, and you've, been a, you've been a legend, Julia, to come on Five of My Life and be so honest and open and authentic. Uh, but I'm not going to let you go until you repay the favour that Tanya and Richard did to you and tell me, <laughs> who do you want to hear on Five of My Life next? I think at this time it's great to be reaching out to people in the creative industries because they're doing it so, so tough. And we need our storytellers. We need the people who help create the space for us to think through um, be issues large and small. So maybe I would say Tim Minchin. Tim Minchin, I would love to get him on. And the fact that you've chosen him might just be the thing that persuades him. <laughs> <laughs> Julia, thank you so much for sharing your five on Five My Life. I know people are going to love listening to your stories. I, I certainly have. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. The Five of My Life was presented by me, Nigel Marsh. Producer, Alex Mitchell. Sound production and theme music by Darcy Thompson and Matt Nicholish. 